Good morning. Good morning to the Lindley family that is scattered, not gathered, and to all others who are watching our service this morning. Several years ago, I did a series on the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs. The first nine chapters in Proverbs are paragraphs. It's when you get to chapter 10 that you discover those individual Proverbs, uh, the ones we're familiar with. But when I got to chapter 10, I stopped thinking if I did those individually, it would take me forever to get through the book, at least several years. So I stopped and then did a study of each one of those verses individually. But I still hadn't figured out how to quite preach it yet. So I laid it aside for several years. And then about a year ago, I picked it up again and decided to deal with those verses from chapter 10 through 31 topically. And I came up with a large number of topics. My goal was to cover all of those verses and those chapters, and it took quite a while to organize them. So a couple of months ago, I started a topical series in the book of Proverbs, meaning that I would deal with the topics covered in chapters 10 through 31. And if you were listening to the series then, you know I covered subjects like the wise and the fool. Then I dealt with the simpleton, which is one of the most fascinating concepts in the book of Proverbs to me. As a matter of fact, it was written for the simpleton, who is a naive person. They could go either way. They could go the way of wisdom or they could go the way of folly. And the book is written to encourage them to go the way of the wise. Then I dealt with the righteous and the wicked. There is so much material on the wicked in the book of Proverbs that I had to divide that into two parts. So I preached part one of the wicked, and then we had the pandemic. So I paused as I addressed that, and then we went through Easter. And so today, I want to go back and do the second message on the wicked in the book of Proverbs. Now, if you missed the other messages and would like to catch up, they are posted on our church website, lindleychurch.com. You'll see at the top something said sermons, and a menu drops down, and the audio version of all the messages in this series is are listed. And there's another little button that says video, and the video version of the messages in this series are posted. At any rate, I want today to talk about the wicked. The presence of wicked people in the world provokes some interesting reactions. I mean by people who are not wicked. One reaction is to be troubled by them. Uh, for example, have you ever been hurt by a wicked person? I think some people are hurt by wicked people physically. Uh, children are sometimes abused physically. Uh, there's domestic violence, not to mention perhaps being mugged. I experienced that once. Somebody trying to rob me in a part of town where there were gangs. So those are the kinds of wicked people, and you react to them by wanting to know where is justice, uh, how do they get away with this. Or some people are hurt by wicked people emotionally. They've been deeply hurt by things done to them, not physically, but things that hurt them deeply emotionally. And of course, uh, stories or legend of people being hurt financially by unscrupulous people. So one reaction to wicked people is that we're troubled by them, that we uh, want to know how they can prosper and how they can get away with it. A second reaction, and this might strike you as a little odd, 
But according to the book of Proverbs, a second reaction you can have to wicked people is to envy them. Now that might strike you as strange, but I think there are situations where there are, say, young people who are attracted to a gang and they would envy the members of the gang. Well, the book of Proverbs addresses these kinds of reactions to wicked people. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, to do three things. Uh, one is, I'd like to talk about what the Lord thinks of wicked people. That's instructive. Secondly, I'd like to just take a string of Proverbs and talk about where their life is headed. That's critical for us understanding our reaction to them. And then thirdly, I'd like to come back to these two reactions that I just mentioned. So first of all, let's look at all the Proverbs that talk about the Lord's reaction to the wicked. For example, in Proverbs 15, 26, we are told, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. Or in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, it says, these six things the Lord hates Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, a heart that devise wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, one who sows discord among the brethren. Now, these passages are simply saying that the Lord detest, which is the meaning of the word abomination, by the way, he detests the wicked people. And in this case, their thoughts. That word, that Hebrew word, means uh, devises, plans, purposes. So all they think and they plan and they scheme, the Lord says, is an abomination to him. He detests that. He hates the planning and the execution of evil. Or there's a proverb in 15.9 that says, The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves those who follow righteousness. So the first thing we're told is that the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination, but we're also told their life here called their way. The very life they live is an abomination to the Lord. Then it says in 15.8, the sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now this one is really fascinating to me. What do you mean the sacrifices of the wicked? Well, in the context of the Old Testament, this is talking about the religious ritual of offering a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. So here is a case where a wicked person is doing something religious. And the Lord says that that's an abomination to him. And it's, they're giving a sacrifice, which he commanded in the Old Testament. But if they're living a wicked life, then even the sacrifice is an abomination to the Lord. The, uh, the sacrifice, the actual religious ritual he requires was an abomination because of the way they live. They live a wicked life. So God is more concerned about the life than he is the religious ritual. He's more concerned about the way people live Monday to Saturday than he is the fact that they go to church on Sunday. But my point is that there are three things that the book of Proverbs says is an abomination to him concerning the wicked. Their thoughts, their life, and their sacrifices. There's more. We are told in 2127, the sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. How much more when he brings it with wicked intent? So, the Lord hates their life, but it's even worse when they do it with a wicked intent. 
It's repugnant to him. Even if they practice religion, he requires. There are a couple of more about the Lord's attitude toward the wicked. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Now that second phrase indicates that the whole verse is talking about prayer. And so what that verse is saying is, the Lord does not hear the prayer of a wicked person. He is not near to hear. He is not near to help. And finally, we're told in Proverbs 3, verse 33, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he who blesses the house is the just. The one he blesses is the just. In other words, a wicked person is probably going to influence his family. They're going to follow him, his example, or his exhortation. And so there's a curse on all who follow the wicked in his own house. Now, the verses I've mentioned so far all describe the Lord's attitude toward the wicked. And the one word that crops up more than any other is abomination. He detests. It is disgusting to him. It is repugnant to him. Those words, detest, disgusted, repugnant, are the very meaning of the word abomination. Now, I want you to think of something that is just repugnant to you. I'm going to pause for a second. I want you to think of something. Think of something that is just absolutely disgusting. Disgusting. Got it? Whatever that might be. That's the way the Lord thinks of the wicked. Now, the second thing I want to do is talk about what happens if you live a wicked life. Now, at this point, I'm going to just jog through a number of Proverbs. I don't expect you to remember everything I'm going to say. What I'm trying to do is create an impression that there are a number of Proverbs that just talk about what's going to happen if you live a wicked life. And I'm just going to read them, comment on them briefly, but I'm after a point that is pertinent to our reaction toward them. So listen carefully as I run through the Proverbs that talk about the destiny of the wicked. For example, chapter 10, verse 28 says, The hope of the righteous will be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Ah, whatever it is that the wicked hope for, their expectation, will not come to pass. It will perish. Dream on. Ultimately, those dreams, sir, will perish. Proverbs 13, 25 says, The righteous eat to the satisfaction of the soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. In other words, they're never satisfied. Imagine, the wicked people are never satisfied. Reminds me of that famous story of Alexander the Great. He conquered the then known world and wept because he didn't have any more nations to conquer. He died at a young age in the state of debauchery. He never got, he was never, he never got all that he wanted. He was never satisfied. Furthermore, they're never secure. Proverbs 10.30 says, the righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not inherit the land. Uh, it says in this translation, the earth, but in the context of the Old Testament, it's talking about the land. And what Solomon has in mind is those Israelites that are living a wicked life are not going to be secure in the land. And as we know, their idolatry and immorality eventually sent them into exile. So the point is, the wicked are not secure as they think they are. Furthermore, 
Wicked people fear they will get caught. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, perhaps this doesn't apply to all wicked people. There are perhaps some exceptions, as I've pointed out in this series. Proverbs are not laws without exceptions. They are things that are generally true. At any rate, people who do wicked things uh, fear. They fear getting caught. They drive with one eye in the rearview mirror. They are constantly looking over their shoulder. They fear getting caught. Perhaps the biblical illustration of this is Herod. He is the one who had John the Baptist executed and then he lived in fear. As a matter of fact, uh, when Jesus appeared, Herod thought that it was the reincarnation of John the Baptist. And Josephus tells us that Herod surrounded himself with musicians and fortune tellers and religious quacks to find some relief from these thoughts that plagued him. So the wicked are fearful that they get caught. They're fearful of what they fear actually happens. So that 1024 says the fear of the wicked will come upon him and the desire of the righteous will be granted. So the fear of the wicked is that they will get caught, perhaps that they will get sick. Maybe they fear bankruptcy or the loss of a reputation. And what this proverb is saying is, yep, and that often happens happens. What they fear comes to pass. They end up in disaster. Furthermore, their own words trap them. Proverbs 12, 13 says, the wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through the trouble. So wicked people are trapped by their own words. By failing to tell the consistent story, the wicked end up trapping themselves. They are a reproach. Proverbs 18.3 says, When the wicked comes, uh, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. In other words, the three companions of wickedness are contempt, dishonor, and reproach. They receive praise, but from the wrong people. Proverbs 28, verse 4 says, Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. In other words, lawbreakers praise lawbreakers. I suppose we all want praise, but praise from the right people, not the wrong people. Furthermore, Again, they are trapped, not just by their words, but by their sin. Proverbs 29, verse 6 says, By transgression an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. Evil people are trapped by their own transgression. Chapter 25, verses 22 and 23 says, His own iniquity ensnares and traps the wicked. The man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He will die for a lack of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Now the context of that verse in chapter 5 is immorality. And what he's saying is the immoral man thinks that no one knows, but his sin will catch up with him, trap him, and lead him astray. Proverbs 12, 21 says, No grave trouble will overtake the righteous, but the wicked shall be filled with evil. The life of evil is filled with evil and trouble. You can't live that kind of a life without experiencing the kind of life you're living. In 13, 17, it says the wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. 
In other words, wicked messengers betray their trust. Their disobedience will be detected and they will be disgraced. Evil will pursue them. Proverbs 13, 21 says, Evil pursues sinners, but the righteous good shall be repaid. Sinners are dogged by the hounds of misfortune, physical harm, bad reputation, loss of possessions. Evil pursues them. And then they will fall. Proverbs 13, 9 says, The light of the rich, uh, righteous rejoice, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Lamp in this verse probably refers to something like their character, their reputation, or their testimony. And it says, it'll be put out. They may have a good reputation for a while, but it will not last long. 29.16 echoes this when it says, The wicked are multiplied, transgressions increase, but the righteous shall see their fall. When the wicked grow in number... There, in power, the wickedness increases. And eventually, they are overthrown. Proverbs 14, 11 says, The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. They'll be brought down by their own wickedness. As 14, 32 says, The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous is a refuge in death. Or 11.5, the righteous of the blameless will direct his way, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. So their wickedness is their destruction. That is where the wicked are headed. In chapter 21, verse 7, it says, The violence of the wicked will destroy them because they refuse to do justice. Violence done to others will boomerang. And in the end, the justice that they plan for others will be done to them. I think that when we are dealt with injustice by wicked people, uh, we get angry. Uh, we sometimes get bitter at what's been done to us. Someone has said that bitterness is like drinking poison, thinking the other person will die. This proverb is saying that you don't have to fret. Justice is coming. Capital J. Justice is coming. Furthermore, the wicked Earn, earnings bring trouble. In 15.6 it says, In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but the revenue of the wicked is trouble. All right, so they earn money by their wickedness. They steal, but it brings them trouble to them and to their household. They receive the trouble of the righteous. Uh, 11.8 says, The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked. This is interesting. There are times when God not only delivers the righteous from trouble, He delivers the, righteous, the, the trouble of the righteous to the wicked. What? How does that work? Well, the biblical illustration of this is Mordecai who in the book of Esther planned to have Haman hung. But in the end, it was Mordecai who was hung instead of uh, Haman. Uh, I, matter of fact, I think I got that backwards. It's Haman who planned the hanging of Mordecai, and Mordecai ended up uh, getting hung. Uh, Haman got hung. Did I get that right? Anyway, read the book of Esther. Chapters 3 through 7, I think it is. The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfruitful for the unright, according to Proverbs 21, 18. That same thought is back in chapter 11, verse 8. He who earnestly seeks good finds favor, but trouble will come to him who seeks evil. Be careful what you seek. In other words, uh, what you seek, you will find. 
they will end up bowing to the righteous. The 1419 says, The evil will bow before the good and the wicked at the gate of the righteous. So evil often wins over good. But there will come the day when evil bows before the good and the wicked will bow before the righteous, according to this proverb, at the gate. So we're told they will be arrested. Proverbs uh, Proverbs uh, says, An evil man seeks only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Uh, the cruel messenger is the lawful authority, that they break the law and the police will come. By the way, this is an interesting little thing. Um, I think God has designed the family to teach people to do what's right. If a person refuses to listen to their parents, then hopefully they'll listen to their peers, and if they have one, perhaps their pastor. If you do not listen to your parents, your peers, or the pastor, you will encounter the police. That is what that proverb is saying. They will be removed from the land. Something like this has been mentioned before, but in Proverbs 2, verses 19 to 22, it says, So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the path of righteous, for the upright will dwell in the land. That's the land of Palestine. And the blameless will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaith will be uprooted from it. Now again, the land is the land of Canaan, it's Palestine. And in the context of the Old Testament, if you're living a righteous life, God said you will dwell in the land. If you don't, then you will be scattered, to use the biblical term. You will be exiled, in this case, to Babylon. So that's what that proverb in chapter 2 is saying. In chapter 11, verse 21, it says, And they will be judged. It says, though they join forces, the wicked will not go unpunished, but the posterity of the righteous will be delivered. All right, so the wicked join together in a gang, in a confederation, but they will not escape justice. They will be judged. 1131 says, if the righteous be recompensed on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner recompense of the righteous is their discipline for sin. And he's simply saying, if God disciplines righteous people when they sin, wow, what's he going to do to the wicked? Peter picks this up in 1 Peter 4.18, where he says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? God deals with the sin of the saint. And you can be sure he will deal with the sin of the sinner. In chapter 4, verse 19, it says, The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Ah, that's an interesting imagery. Uh, the Bible uses the metaphor of light and darkness to refer to righteousness and sin, or holiness and wickedness. And so what this proverb is saying is if you're living a wicked life, it's like walking in a dark room. You will stumble because you don't see what's in front of you. You aren't aware of where you're walking. Matter of fact, I had that happen to me recently. I got out of bed and it was dark and I literally stumbled over something as I was moving from the bed to get out of the bedroom. That's what this is saying about wickedness. It's like they live in a dark room and they're going to stumble. Then they're going to be destroyed. 10.29 says, The way of the Lord is strength for the upright, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Ah, it says, the way of the Lord is strength. That Hebrew word means a place of safety, a protection, of refuge. But destruction is going to come to the wicked. Ruin, terror, 
dismay all bound up in that Hebrew word. The point is, the wicked are headed for destruction. 21.15 says, It is the joy of the just to do justice, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. When the wicked do wrong, they will ultimately experience ruin. Now, if the righteous do justice, there's joy. When the wicked do injustice, there is judgment. Now, I told you we were going to run through a number of Proverbs. There's more. But hang with me. There is a payoff that has to do with us who are not described as right wicked in the book of Proverbs. But let's continue. 13.6 says, The righteous guards him whose way is blameless, but the wicked overthrows the wickedness overthrows the sinner. Again, the idea is the wicked person is headed for ruin, for being overthrown. He's headed for destruction. 1025 says, They are destroyed by storms. When the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. The storms of life destroy the wicked. Or as Jesus said, when the rain, flood, and wind comes, the house built on a rock will not fall, but the house built on the sand will. The point being, the storms of life destroy wicked people. And they will not recover. 24, 15, and 16 says, Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place, for a righteous man will fall seven times and rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Wow, what a proverb. Righteous sometimes fall, but they get up. The wicked will fall and not get up. Wicked people are headed for disaster and destruction and death. It says that over and over again in these passages. For example, 12.7 uh, says, The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Uh, Solomon wrote Proverbs, and he probably had an example of this in his own father. If you will recall the story, Saul seemed to be the master of the situation. David, Solomon's father, seemed to be forsaken. But in the end, it was Saul who was overthrown, and David's house was established. That's the point of Proverbs 12, verse 7. They will die, that is the wicked, prematurely. 10.27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. As a rule, I said there were exceptions, wicked men are cut off prematurely. Just think about that. person joins a gang. They're gangland slayings, and they get killed as young men. They're reprisal killings. Death caused by drunkenness, drugs, and the like. So you just participate in wickedness and you're headed for death and it may be premature death because you'll be cut off in the, in the young years of life instead of the latter years of life. 10.2 says the wickedness leads to premature death. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing but the righteous delivers from death. So wickedly obtained wealth profits nothing. Um, but that doesn't seem to be true, does it? Sometimes the wicked prosper. Some people, some wicked people profit from stealing. But the parallel in this verse indicates that death is the judgment that is meant. Wickedness leads to death, premature physical death. One commentator claims that death in Proverbs does not mean a single, merely physical event, 
but a realm of conflict in life. It includes calamity, sickness, and sin. I think he's right. I mentioned a minute ago that the Bible uses the metaphor of light and darkness to talk about spiritual things like truth and error and righteousness and unrighteousness. But it also uses life and death. I think that we normally think of death in the Bible as uh, physical or spiritual, we're separated from God, or eternal. And all that's true. But what I've discovered in studying the scripture is that the word death in the Bible is used of more than that. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says that a young widow will live in pleasure, though she be dead, and she'll live in death, uh, is the idea. Well, she's not dead physically, she's not dead spiritually, she's living in the realm of sin, and that is described in the Bible as the realm of death, because it leads to destruction and ruin and death. So Proverbs 11:19 says the righteous leads to life. So he who pursues evil pursues it to his own death. So life and death spoken of here are physical. That it not only leads to the realm of death, it ultimately leads to physical death. And they die, and when they die, their expectations die with them. Proverbs 11.7 says, when, the, uh, when a wicked man dies, his expectations will perish, and the hope of the unjust perish. You cannot take your expectations to the grave. Or as someone has said, a fool is a man uh, whose all of his plans end up at the grave. When they die... And I've said a lot about that in the last couple of minutes. But when they die, their name is disgusting. Proverbs 10, 7 says, The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. What a vivid way to put it. Uh, you live a wicked life, your body rots, and so does your reputation. Parents name their sons John, not Judas. That's sort of the idea. Proverbs 13, 5 says, The righteous man hates lying, but the wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. Again, they are going to be disgusted, disgusting. They will rot. Uh, they're going to come to shame. And when they die... The city rejoices. 11.10 says, And when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is jubilation. This is probably talking about rulers. At any rate, when they die, there's going to be a celebration, especially if they are in control. Furthermore, they will fulfill God's purpose by being punished. Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord will make all for himself, yes, even the wicked, for the day of doom. Now, this does not mean that God has created some for damnation. The little expression for himself means for its own end or purpose. The Lord has done everything for its own end, and that indicates the appointment of an evil day for the wicked who deserve it. So, the wicked end up destroyed. That's the one thought that I think comes through all of this. Hear it and hear it carefully. According to the book of Proverbs, in numerous Proverbs, I've just run through oh, more than 30. The wicked are headed for destruction and death. Hannibal filled three bushels of gold, uh, with gold rings taken from knights 
he had slaughtered, but he committed suicide by swallowing poison. Few noted his passing, and they left the earth completely unmourned. Julius Caesar, dyeing his garments in the blood of a million of his foes, conquered 800 cities only to be stabbed by his best friend at the scene of his greatest triumph. Napoleon, the feared conqueror, after being scour the scourge of Europe, spent his last years in banishment. So here is the point. The wicked are headed for ruin, destruction, and death. Now what I've done so far is basically say two things. I've said the Lord detest them and all kinds of calamity and destruction and ruin and premature death are going to come upon them. But I said I had three things to say. So let me move to the third. What is the lesson we should learn from this? I mean, you can read the book of Proverbs and think, thank God I'm not one of the wicked, uh, which is true. But what does the book of Proverbs say we should learn? What's our lesson, even though you're not a wicked person? Well, there's two. I mentioned them at the beginning, but let's talk about them in a little more detail. Proverbs 24, 19, and 20 says this, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked, for there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. All right, here's the lesson. Don't fret. Don't worry. Don't get angry because you've been dealt by unjustly by a wicked person. Don't fret because they are headed for judgment and destruction. They will not have a blessed life, which is what these verses are saying in chapter 24. Their prosperity, here called their lamp, will come to an end. They will die. So do not bother to fret. The end, one way or the other, is bad. In the end, the wicked lose. So when you see wickedness going on, don't fret. Don't worry. God will take care of this in the end. The second lesson we are to learn is don't be envious. As a matter of fact, uh, the verses I read in chapter 24, verses 19 and 20 say, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. Well, that, is, that idea is repeated in the same chapter in verses 1 and 2, where it says, Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. So, again, in the context of the book of Proverbs, the, don't be envious of evil people. Uh, because, just look at their end. Their end is destruction. I think it should be put in the context of the fact that Solomon wrote this book for his son. He addresses his son over and over. This is clearly written to a young man. Perhaps it's the young who are tempted to be envious of wicked people. And Solomon is saying to his son, Now son, don't be envious of wicked people. Because ultimately they're headed for ruin and destruction. There's an old... Uh, adage that says something like, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. You ever heard that? I heard somebody say this week, yeah, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, but the roots are brown. I've never heard it put like that. The way I heard it is a little more crass and crude, but I think fits what the book of Proverbs is trying to say. 
Yeah, the grass may look greener on the other side of the fence, but that's because it's on the top of a septic tank. And that's what he's saying. Don't envy that. They may look like they're prospering for the moment, but in the end, in the end, there is judgment and ruin and destruction and death. Don't envy wicked people and certainly don't emulate them. All right. I said we were going to run, didn't I? You feel exhausted? I do. Uh, all right, let's sum all this up. What is the book of Proverbs saying about the wicked? Well, I said there's so much. I divided this into two, um, two messages. In the first one, I talked about the way they think, the way they talk, and the way they act. In this one, I've talked about the result of all of that, the result with the Lord, and the result just in their life. And the bottom line is this, since the Lord detests the wicked, and since they will be destroyed, do not fret over their temporary success, and do not be envious of them. Now, that summarizes a lot of material in the book of Proverbs. I'm going to repeat it. Since the Lord detests the wicked, and since the wicked are headed for destruction, do not fret over their temporary success, and do not be envious of them. Now I want to close by making two other observations. You might notice, as I quote these Proverbs, that I only dealt with half in each case, virtually all cases. That is, the way the book of Proverbs is written, it'll say, the righteous do this and the wicked do that. And what I've done is gone through and isolate all that it said about the righteous and did some messages on that. And then I isolated all it says about the wicked and I did two messages on that. But as I've gone through this, it struck me that's not the way the book is written. The book is written by putting the two together. And so bound up in the way the book of Proverbs is written, especially in chapters 10 through 31, the point is this. Imagine Solomon talking to his son. Son, this is what the righteous are like. This is what happens to the righteous. And this is what the wicked are like. And this is what happens to the wicked. So what's he saying? He's saying, in essence, life has choices. And choices have consequences. And I would add, and you have control over your choices, and you don't have control over the consequences. That it seems to me that that's one of the great messages that screams from proverb after proverb after proverb. If you are a parent, or a grandparent, or teach children, I think you ought to teach them these principles. They are critical for living a wise life. Let me repeat, life is filled with choices. The book of Proverbs screams that. Secondly, choices have consequences. We just saw some of that today, but we've seen it in previous messages. The book of Proverbs shouts that over and over again. And finally, you have control over the choice, but once you make the choice, you do not have control over the consequences. That, I think, is what Solomon is trying to teach his son. And that, I think, is what we ought to teach our children and grandchildren and all the children over which we have an influence. One other observation. 
There's one other proverb on wickedness I haven't covered. To my knowledge, I've in these two messages covered every verse in the book of Proverbs on wickedness, except this. Listen to Proverbs 20, verse 22. Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will save you. My final observation is let the Lord deal with the wicked. That, in essence, is what that is saying. Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord. Now, uh, take the injustice that's been done to you to the Lord, and he will deliver you. By the way, note this proverb does not say that he will punish the evil. He says that in all these other proverbs. Paul says that in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 19. But this verse says, the Lord will deliver you. So commit your deliverance out of the distress and your vindication to the Lord, and he will deliver you. I can just imagine the response I would get if I told that to somebody in a counseling context. And they would say, but the wicked person prospers. And the wicked person got away with it. And the wicked person is still prospering. And it makes me angry. Don't fret. Don't be envious. Deliver it to the Lord. We haven't read the last chapter yet. A farmer had a disdain for religious people. He plowed on Sunday. He would shake his fist at church people as they passed by on the way to church. October came, and the farmer had the finest crop he had ever had. It was the best in the whole county when the harvest was complete. He placed an advertisement in the local paper, which embittered Christians uh, for their faith in God. At the end of the diatribe, he wrote, quote, Faith in God must not mean much if someone like me can prosper. In the next edition of the town paper, a small ad appeared. It read simply, God does not always settle his accounts in October. Think about that. Father, thank you for these insights into wicked people. Because it does seem to us that wickedness prospers. That un injustice prevails. So thank you for this reminder. That we are to trust you. Not fret. Not be envious. But let you take care of the situation. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.